So where we left off the other day is in prana. And I want to talk a little bit about that. I pulled up my old notes. <laughs> I've been using this notes forever. I actually pulled out my four chapters on freedom. And because I actually wanted to cite this translation instead of um, PRTs. This, this translation is a little bit more cut and dry. It's, it's a kind of a nice translation to use um, just because it's, it's very to the point. I'm sorry, I'm talking about Sutra 250. This is from 250. 251 is what kind of starts to happen when you start to move beyond the sphere of breath. And Sutra 251, again, I'll, I'll just read it from this translation. You don't have to write this down. It's pretty much what I said before, just a little bit more to the point. Pranayama is external, so it's outside of us. It's internal. or suppressed, like it stops, okay? It's moving outside, moving inside, or it's stopped. Regulated by place. One of the words that you can substitute for place is space. So it's regulated by the space time in number and becomes prolonged and subtle. Okay? It's a loaded statement. There's so much to unpack there. Kind of like stira sukha. I mean, we can spend the whole month talking about that one. <laughs> but <clears throat> this is kind of the essence of what we're doing. Um, is learning how to master our prana, is learning our relationship with this, what we call in yoga, this energetic life force. Now remember that this energetic life force that we're calling prana, which also means to animate, is, is being projected, I'm getting a little woo-woo right now, okay, is being projected from the soul, from the Atman, from the, the, the consciousness, from that which is inhabiting Stephanie is now projecting prana. The soul leaves, prana leaves, you know. <clears throat> Not to deviate too much, um, but yogis in the, in the tradition really experiment with this idea a lot. This is the realm of where we start to hear these fucking crazy stories of dead bodies coming to life. Um, and, and there's a lot of stories like this in India, especially amongst these yogis. Whether or not you believe them or not, there's actually some stories that are documented. Like you can go to India and go that, like, like the equivalency of the Times, the New York Times has published, not the New York Times, the equivalency of the New York Times in India published and chronicled some of these stories. And what yogis do is start to experiment with the pranic life force, the animating inanimate objects. And, and they also, there's also these practices where they actually will take their prana and then move it into another person or another object. And when you start to read the books, Living with the Himalayan Masters, or I like actually, I prefer At the Eleventh Hour, which is Pandaji's, my teacher, his biographical um, story about Swami Rama, it's really interesting. And it, it kind of takes apart Living with the Himalayan Masters and offers a different perspective, which I really enjoyed a lot. But some of the stories in there are just mind-blowing. 
And all of it, a lot of it has to do with this sutra, understanding the sutra. And just know that it will take you a long time to unpack it yourself. It's not something that I can offer in the next 20 some odd days. Pardon? <laughs> she wants a refund. <laughs> so <laughs> I came to this course so I could know how to animate a dead body, Yogi Aaron. <laughs> and levitate. <laughs> what do you mean we can't levitate? <laughs> but all of that is in this sutra. And so now that I've kind of built the sutra up a little bit, let's try to unpack it a little bit. So, again, pranayama, prana, energetic life force, is either held outside or inside. <clears throat> and I said something very important the other day that will hopefully begin to help you unpack or, or decodify this, is that it's understanding, I think one of the first steps is understanding that that which prana, which animates everything around us, is essentially the same prana that animates us. And so we are not separable. We are inseparable. And that is a huge thing. I sometimes wonder and pontificate on this idea that is my energy low because I've put up a wall between me and the universe? Like I've forgotten. This, this wall is sometimes a video. You forget. You don't know. Is that wall sometimes because I just forget my connection to everything, my pranic connection to everything? But here's another idea just to kind of throw a whole monkey or a wrench into, monkey wrench into it is that one of my favorite definitions of a yogi comes from Krishnamacharya, which is the definition of a yogi who is is one whose spine is full of light. And that this idea comes, you know, this idea or this definition has so much going on because it helps us understand the focus of our practice, which is to get prana moving towards us is to get prana moving into our spine, is to get our spine completely activated. One of the things that I've talked about once or twice is this idea of shashumna awakening, awakening the shashumna, awakening that pranic force within our spine. And, and I think specifically in relationship to uh, Nadi Shodana or Analoma Viloma Pranashuti, it's really about getting those pranic currents activated. But at another level, it's actually this teaching as well. It's bringing pranic awareness into your spine and starting to not only balance it, but also build that pranic force within your spine. Well, so this is a good question. Does it have to mean your physical spine? Shishumna Nadi, you know, some people f say it's in their spine, but the teachings actually say, based on my understanding, is that Shishumna actually is sort of in front of the spine. So it actually is not in the spine. And when Krishnamacharya said that, he wasn't, I don't, believe that he was actually talking about the physical spine, per se. He was talking about Shashumna Nadi. So that's the way that it's been taught to me, and that's the way I, I also hear it. So you're really wanting to get Shashumna Nadi, but, but the way, one of the ways that we access Shashumna Nadi is through the spine, or through the movement of the spine, and through alignment in the spine. Alan Finger spent, you know, I remember taking countless classes with him, and him and one, in those classes, what he would say, and I, I teach classes now like this too, where I say, close your eyes and start to feel the shishumna. 
and start to use that as your guideline for alignment. Because if you kind of close your eyes and you're sitting like this, like that just doesn't feel good and feel right. And so if I start to, I can sort of start to find my alignment. And I, if I tune into the Shishuna, I can feel it lengthening inside of me. I can feel it lengthening. <laughs> Does that make sense? Practice closing with your eyes with your eyes closed. I know that Karina's done that. I've been doing, watching the, the videos as I've been editing them. And um, one point I heard her say, like, you know, I invite you to close your eyes. Like, where, where it's possible, start to close your eyes. And it just adds this different dimension. Because when your eyes are open, your attention is going outward. That's not a judgment. It's a fact. And they also say, which is why we practice dristi in yoga, that if your eyes are moving, then your mind is moving. So if your eyes are moving around, your, your, <laughs> your, your, your mind is moving. And so this is why we say, but even with your eyes closed, you do need to have a fulcrum. You can't just close your eyes and say, okay. You need to have a fulcrum. And so in our tradition, a focus point, that the, tr the tradition, we bring that focus. You can do it to your spine. You can do it to the third eye. You can do it to your heart. You can do it to a chakra. Typically, the navel center, third eye, heart center. Um, and then you can bring it to other places as well. So you're having this energy, this prana, which is either outside of you or inside of you and that's regulated by place. And so regulated, this is actually, I like this word a lot, regulated, because what is the word that people often use to describe pranayama that's the wrong word? Control. Yeah, control. We just, I hate that word. <laughs> I mean, I think most people hate that word. You don't, who wants to be controlled, you know? And I always think of, like, what are we learning to do? We're learning to dance with the Divine Mother. You know, when we're trying to control her, does that mean we're putting a muzzle on her, putting her into the Iron Maiden? Um, you know, this is how she's been treated so much in the past. We need to let her be free, but also say, okay, you can dance in this area here. <laughs> you have this big space to dance. And then your job is to increase that capacity so that you can make the space bigger. So this word regulated, we're learning to regulate our prana. We're learning to dance with our prana, do the, the mamba or the salsa or the tango <laughs> with, his, with her. Sorry? <laughs> um, we're learning to regulate it by where are we placing the prana. So we're bringing awareness to the place that we, to where we place this pranic force by time. So how long are you doing this practice? You can decide, like, am I doing it 30 minutes a day or 20 minutes a day or for five minutes? So there's a certain amount of time. Now, one of the key words here is number. And I've only ever had one teacher explain this to me. And this is a very important idea that you probably will never learn anywhere else unless you have a very special teacher. <laughs> um, unless you go study with Rod and he actually does this teaching. Rod is who I learned this from. I've never heard any other teacher talk about this that in my experience. This Sanskrit word for number, and I'll spell it for you, is angula. A-N-G-U-L-A. -A, angula. Now, angula is a way, is a measurement system. 
And there's a whole science around this. The way that I understand it from Rod is that there's a whole science, a whole, um, sometimes we call it vidya, like a teaching, a, a knowledge. There's videos about everything, but there's a whole vidya about this that is used and that people really practice diligently every day. Now, angula me is a measurement system, and typically one angula is one finger, the, the width, not the length, the width of a finger. And so two angulas would be two fingers, more or less, and three would be three and four, and so on. And the way that I understand this teaching is that for everything you do, there should be a specific amount of angulas. Now, what is that angula that we're referring to? What is the distance? We're talking about the breath. And so if you place your hand underneath your nose, for example, just bring it down about maybe eight angulas or 10 angulas and go breathe out really loud or, or, or forcefully, sorry. So when you're running and doing your marathon practicing, there should be a certain amount of angulas um, that you're breathing. You know, you're not going to say, you know, lessen the angulas, it's going to increase. When you're having tantric sex, there should be a certain amount of angulas. When you're eating, there sure should be a certain amount of angulas. Now, how much that should be, I don't know. <laughs> I've never studied it to that degree. But I can tell you that when we're meditating or practicing deep pranayama, at least pranayama according to Sutra 251, how many angulas do you think there should be? Sorry? No, 108. That would be like from here to the room below me to Karina. Um, no, there should be really one or two angulas, three maybe. You're, you're not breathing that much. It's very low. Your, your angulas is very low below your, your nose. <laughs> so what you're essentially doing is your breathing starts to become, I don't want to say shallow, it becomes very soft. Sorry? Yes. You're retaining the prana. When I first met Rod back in 2001, it was August, I remember we got on this big topic because I was really into Ashtanga at that time. And I was really trying to reconcile like this new idea of yoga. But one of the topics we had was talking about sweat. And he pointed out that every time we sweat, we're actually releasing our prana. You know, if you read the, the tradition and their description of, especially in the Hatha Yoga Pratapika about sweating, you know, they talk about like, when you first start sweating, it's toxic, get rid of it. But after a while, your sweat is gonna be beautiful and wonderful and actually will have a nice glow or add a nice glow to the yogi or yogini. And to take your hands and rub that sweat back into your body. Because that's your life force energy. That's your prana. So there's this idea of looking at what are we expending and minimizing that and holding on to our pranic life force. Even in, I believe, um, Chinese medicine. You know, you see a lot of, um, I used to go to the sauna a lot uh, at my gym in Vancouver. A um, lot of Asian people there, and especially Chinese people, and would often see them in the sauna, these men in their kind of underwear, you know, and then rubbing the, the, the sweat back into them. So in Chinese medicine, we all also see that come up as well. And, but the thing that really stood out to me that Rod said, and it's always stuck in my head since, because we got on the topic of Bikram yoga one day, 
And he said, look it. The Tao, according to Taoism, you come into the world with one cup. That's it. <laughs> Every time you sweat, something leaves that cup. <laughs> because I was one of these kinds of people that I do sweat a lot. But also, the, the way that I was breathing was not practicing the sutra at all. And, you know, I'd breathe like... <laughs> Oh, I'm doing this through my mouth, but doing it through my nose, like, <sighs> I was really a deep Ujjayi Pranayama person. It took me years to stop that habit because I had ingrained it so deeply. But that kind of breath is, not only is it stimulating, it's also releasing a lot of prana. Yeah, I'm getting a lot of prana, but I'm also releasing a lot of prana. So when I told you about my experience in Hawaii and doing all that wonderful stuff in that two-week period, that was my practice every morning for one hour, this practicing Sutra 250 every day for an hour. And, I mean, I was so focused. Oh, my God. wish I could get that focus back. Um, <laughs> but that's this practice and I was going to kind of leave this talk here and just kind of move on but I've decided I want to give you guys a little taste of this practice so we're going to do a very short asana practice and, um, and then we'll do a little bit of a meditation well not a meditation a pranayama practice which is nothing, by the way, what you think it will be. So throw any expectations out. And, um, and then we'll move on with the rest of our talk today and practice. That sounds good? Okay. So let's take five minutes and just set up. And, um, and Brittany, we don't need to stop anything. Just let it run. Um, but maybe, Brittany, what we can do is put you here. Um, like I said, we're just going to do like a 20-minute asana practice. It's not going to be very long. <laughs> 